alaykum everyone and welcome to The Good Tree, the place inspired by the verse in the Qur'an of a good word that is like a good tree, whose roots are firm and branches reach great heights. You are joined today by your hosts, myself, Fizza and Noor. Assalamu alaykum everyone. This series is all about how we can perfect our morals in all of our relationships. In today's episode, we will be discussing the relationship with our neighbours. We are delighted and honoured to have with us today Sheikh Muhammad Ali Shamadi, who is a renowned scholar and graduate of the Islamic Seminaries of Qum. After completing his BA and MA in Western Philosophy at the University of Tehran, he earned his doctorate in philosophy from the University of Manchester. Sheikh is the founding director of the International Institute for Islamic Studies in Qum and is also the founding director of Risalat International Institute, which is devoted to Islamic curriculum development and educational training. He has led numerous Islamic educational courses and seminars globally. Dear Sheikh, Assalamu alaikum and welcome to The Good Tree. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. And I, so I say my salam to all the listeners. Shaykhna, we all have neighbours, so some of them better than others. And say the Fatima Salam Laleha has ingrained in us the teaching of neighbour before home. So we know that Islam puts a lot of emphasis on our relationship with our neighbours. So could you explain to us what is our responsibility towards our neighbours? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala tayyibin al tahiri in the Quran, neighbors are given a special position. And we re- learn from the Quran that in addition to our general outlook and approach to every person and every citizen, we need to have a special regard for neighbors. And then this is illustrated in the behavior and teachings of the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. For example, it is mentioned by Shaykh Kulaydi Rahmatullah Alai in Al Kafi that Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam said, Inna al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam awsa bihim wa ma zala rasulullah yusi bihim hatta vananna annana sayu annahu sayu barrithum. Rasulullah kept so much talking about neighbors that Amir al-Mu'minin said, we thought that neighbors also inherit from each other. This is a sign of great respect for, you know, neighbors, because, you know, even, for example, with close relatives, how many times you meet them during the week? Maybe some of them once a week, maybe some of them once a month, some people, you know, even less. But neighbors are people that we are day and night somehow living together and some of you know, how interacting with each other. So it's very close relation. And if we can make this relation a godly relation, a respectful relation, it can help everyone. But if we are not careful, then this can become very troublesome relation. We can, you know, without even noticing, harm them, annoy them, hurt them with our behavior. So it's a great thing that Islam tells us that we should be always mindful and inshallah in the course of discussion, you know, we can refer to different aspects of this relation. Thank you very much, Shekhna, for that beautiful explanation. You were saying about making our neighbors a bit like godly neighbors or like showing that love towards them. And we've heard something about the seventh neighbor so what constitutes a neighbor and what falls under an individual's responsibility as a neighbor? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kullu arba'ina daran jiranun min bayni yaday wa min khalfihi wa an yaminihi wa an shimali. So 40 houses from every direction is wow. the extent <laughs> of your neighbor. And Imagine uh, in the past was only one level, but now sometimes, you know, we have people in different floors <laughs> also. <laughs> so people who are, you know, upstairs, you know, in the higher floors or, you know, lower, they are also neighbors. Also, Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam said, 
الجوارو اربعون دارن من اربعت جوانبها so neighbor is someone that is within 40 houses from four directions wow so all those 40 houses have the same level of responsibility towards them or no it differs so all of them are neighbors so whatever we say about neighbor includes them but then among neighbors so those who are closer maybe we have extra care for them but all these 40 are neighbors so whatever in islam we hear about neighbor includes all these 40 houses from every direction okay that's really interesting i've, I've actually heard the seven neighbors but i've never heard this 40. yes um, that puts a huge responsibility on us basically this also helps to somehow cover the whole city you know so if mu'minin everywhere extend good relation with 40 people from every direction so whole city can be covered with a net of beautiful relations so then mu'minin should be looking to buy houses in you know in every 40 um, <laughs> kind of neighborhood okay thank you so much for that Sheikh. so i want to understand when we're talking about respecting neighbors i mean okay you can smile at them you can you know give a polite greeting make some small talk ask how they're doing offer to help if they need help but what is it that we need to do in terms of looking after our neighbors what is it beyond just greeting them and saying hello you know respect is the minimal so if i am annoying them i am hurting them i am insulting them this is not respect. But respect is not enough if it does not come with also ihsan. You know, in Islam, we have to be always muhsan, yeah? Quran talks about ihsan many times. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. So first is justice, not to violate their rights. Then we have to build upon that ihsan. So now ihsan, for example, if your neighbor is ill ihsan is to visit to offer help if your neighbor for example i don't know needs something if your neighbor for example cannot take uh, for example her children for example you know a school this day for example you know we help each other we support each other and this is not a kind of waste of time or you know a kind of trouble this should be a pleasure this should be done with sense of responsibility and it's a requirement of being a Muslim that wherever a Muslim lives neighbors should be happy and grateful that we have this Muslim in our neighborhood okay so then when we're you know looking out for our neighbors does that also constitute for example making sure that their property is safe if they're away looking yes. out for thieves yes Anything that you expect from your own neighbors, you know, that if you are away, you know, you expect them to watch your house, you know, to be careful. So you would also offer the same and even you try to do more so that you don't miss, you know, what is needed. Yeah. Okay. So related to this is that I feel like there's a fine line between being a nosy neighbor and a yeah. you know, caring neighbor. Yes. Where do we draw that line that I look out for my neighbors, but I don't want to interfere too much in their lives. Or... Exactly. So the main thing is that you make yourself available, make good relation with them and tell them that I am there for you. But we should know that people have different cultures. So basically to build the good relation and then make yourself available. If they don't want, that's another issue. We shouldn't impose ourselves, you know, even ihsan should be something that is not imposed, you know, people should be voluntarily asking for it. But they should know that you are there for them. In the time of need, you are there for them. Yeah, absolutely. Inshallah, we can all put that into practice. I've moved several houses, so I've experienced different types of neighbors. Yes. And sometimes you might see something that you shouldn't have seen or be exposed to something or like a neighbor tells you something about another neighbor that you didn't really want to know how do you deal with these you know it's like a breach of their privacy how do you deal with it when 
you find something out because you're their neighbor. Or for example, you hear a fight uh, from the neighbors, for example. How do you deal with that? You know, we should not be uh, nosy and we should not, you know, spy on people, you know, look into their secrets. But sometimes uh, things themselves come to our knowledge. It's not that I wanted to know, but they come to our knowledge. Mm. Here, then we have to keep them confidential. Unless there is something that, you know, is a huge responsibility that, for example, I have to do something to save someone's life or, you know, those are the different things. But as long as there is just something personal or not something, you know, which is going to be massively dangerous, we should just keep secrets of people to ourselves and we should not even let them know that we know because then they will be embarrassed always, you know. We have here a hadith from Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. He says about the right of the neighbor, وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ لَهُ عَوْرَةِ فَإِنْ عَلِمْتَ عَلَيْهِ السُّؤَانْ سَتَرْتَهُ عَلَيْهِ So you don't try to find out anything which they don't want to be shared, anything which is private. And if you come to know, فَإِنْ عَلِمْتَ عَلَيْهِ السُّؤَانْ سَتَرْتَ عَلَيْهِ You cover it. You don't share it with other people. Even you don't need to share it, for example, with your siblings or you know your parents you know spouse keep it to yourself unless there are some other considerations that you know override this for example as i said if someone is in danger and you know that's another issue mm. we have to deal with it wisely okay that's really important thank you for sharing that how do we deal with neighbors who are aggressive or they're not good neighbors to you as an individual I once had a neighbor who would get drunk. So mm -hmm. I would see things from him that weren't, you know, for example, comfortable to deal with as a neighbor. How do you deal with people like that? I know we always should be on the best akhlaq, but then there is a fine line between yeah. being worried that they might actually do something to hurt you or your family. Again, here we have a general point and then we have exceptions. The general point is, that part of being a good neighbor is to be tolerant. Because, you know, if you are not annoying people, but as soon as, you know, they raise their, you know, TV voice or something, you know, you go and knock the door. This is not good. You know, you have to be careful not to annoy people. But if they do things that they annoy you, you should be tolerant. This is the general principle. There are exceptions that this is going to become more, you know, this is going to be dangerous, this is going to be offensive, you know, that's another issue. But generally speaking, we have to be patient. Imam Qazim salam says, Laysa husnul jawar kaffal adha. Good neighboring is not just not to harm people and annoy people. Walakin husnul jawar sabruka ala al adha. So you have to be patient with people who annoy you. So just not to annoy is not enough. Mm. A good neighbor should be patient. Like, for example, if your brother, if your son, you know, is your neighbor and they make noise, what do you do? You try to be patient. Hopefully. But if it becomes too much, then I'm, as I said, this is secondary. Uh, general principle. But for example, you know, they never let your children sleep and, you know, you cannot, you know, work, you know, then you can talk to them, but nicely. If there is something that you can manage, it's better to be tolerant. Okay, and like, you know, being tolerant, to what extent should we be, be tolerant? What if it's infringing on how we live? For example, you're doing some building work and your neighbor makes, let's say, a big fuss that, for example, you've done damage to their property. and it wasn't your fault. It was the damage that was already there. Do we just swallow that and go and pay for the, them to fix that problem, that damage, even though we know that it wasn't our fault because we're trying to be a tolerant, good neighbor? Is that the higher thing to do, the better thing to do? Or is it better to no, fight for our right, take them to court? We didn't do this damage. Can you see what I'm trying to say? It's like, do we want to cause friction and go to court or no? Just pay for it, it doesn't matter. You know, if there is something that it's uh, not causing you too much trouble, 
it's better to keep them happy and pleased, even if it is not necessary. Mm. Okay? Suppose you are, it's like you are giving them a gift. But if it is uh, too much, and or for example, you know, they are not going to be satisfied anyway, then, okay, you can go to other routes. But if it is something easy, even if it is not, you know, something that you owe them, as a kind of ihsan, you do it for them. Okay. So I guess sometimes you might have to call the authorities. Yeah, if it's needed, yeah. But I'm saying that we don't need always to go to the legal procedures. You know, we should be able to solve it among ourselves. And if it is a matter of, you know, a few pounds, you know, that, you know, I can manage or depending on my situation, for, my, for me, it's not a big deal. Mm. I can keep them happy. If it's too much or, you know, they expect too much, they are not going to be satisfied, then maybe I have to go to legal procedures. You know, there is a hadith which says, Al-mu'minu sahlu al-qadai wal Mu'min is a person which is e very easy to deal with. So, for example, if Mu'min borrows money, he makes sure that gives you back on time and thanks you a lot, maybe also gives you a gift. But if he lends you money, he's flexible as much as possible. He's not going to, go, going to come after you and chase you as much as possible. So we have to learn that when it comes to offering, we should be able to offer. When it comes to receiving, we should be hesitant. So we are, should be hesitant to expect something from our neighbors. We should try to rely on ourselves, but we should be happy to offer. And in this way, a person you know, looks this way, society will become like heaven. Of course, maybe we can never have this 100%, but at least everyone can try. And the good thing is that for us, it is not wasted, even if, if our neighbors are not appreciated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates. This is part of our relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your relation with your neighbors is part of your relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wow. Thank you so much for highlighting that. I think we forget. We think, you know, neighbors aren't part of our relationship with Allah, but clearly they are. Yeah. The same is with relation with, you know, parents, uh, siblings, friends, colleagues, any relation that we have, even if there is, a, I don't know, tree, for example, in our garden, any relation is part of our relation with Allah because Allah wants me to be a source of mercy for everyone. So these are not wasted. These are all investments. Ahsan Sheikh, thank you so much. You're welcome. When we're talking about neighbors, obviously those of us who live in the UK or in the West, we have neighbors from all walks of life, from different religious backgrounds, different cultures, like you said. Is there a difference between how we should treat a neighbor who is a Muslim and a neighbor who is non-Muslim, or is there no difference? Every neighbor should be respected, even if they are not Muslims. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Amir al-Mu'minin, Ya Ali, akram al-jar walau kana kafiran. O oh, Ali, respect your neighbor even if he or she is a kafir, is infidel. But of course, if they are believers, we have more respect if they are, you know, Muslim, Mu'min, uh, believers in God, for example, Christians. We respect more than the end person who doesn't believe in God. But even if someone doesn't believe in God, still, as a neighbor, we respect them. So, akram al-jar walu kana kafir. But is there like extra effort we should put with the neighbors who are Muslim? Yeah? We can say, yes. We can say that people who are closer have more rights. You know, for example, if a neighbor is also a relative. Yeah. If a neighbor is a member of community of, you know, our own community. So these are additional reasons, but the, it's just extra. It's not that either we respect or we don't respect. No, we respect everyone, but for some people, we have more degrees of care and support and respect. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I mean, sometimes what I've seen is that people are hesitant to build a relationship with their non-Muslim neighbors because of some of the fiqhi restrictions when it comes to food or drink and 
you know, if I cook for them, they might cook for me. And it's just, how do we overcome that kind of obstacle? In fact, of course, you know, for example, if they are people of the book, now most of Maharaj say they are Tahir. But even if, for example, they are not people of the book, you know, if you are not sure they have touched something, you know, if they give you a piece of cake or, you know, there's no problem. If they give you meat and then that's a problem. And of course, you may not eat or you say, you know, for example, if they invite you, you can say in advance that you are, for example, eating vegetarian or halal or, you know, and if people, people are very normally respectful to the, because there are many people who have different kinds of diets. Some people cannot have nuts, some people cannot have, you know, gluten. So if they see in you respect, they understand and appreciate. And here you should not also do ihtiyat uh, too much. If they give you something that, you know, it's not meat and you, you don't know that it's touched by nudges, so you can have it in the same way that maybe you go to a, a coffee shop, you take something. You know, one of our Maharaj went uh, in Iran to the house of a Christian family and they brought some cake and he had it, but uh, the people who were with him, some of them, they didn't have it. And it was very sad that the Marja is having, but the people who were with the Marja, is, they are doing it here. Yeah. So we have to be not more Catholic than the Pope, you know. True. So I guess it's mindful not to hurt their feelings. Yes. In this case. So as long as, from Fiqh point of view, we are not doing something haram, it's good. You don't need to do ihtiyat here because there is a good point in. But if it is haram, it's a clearly haram, of course, you observe it. I think from what you're saying, Islam makes things easy. It makes relationships very easy and yeah. it makes it easy to build good relationships. But we kind of put these boundaries for ourselves that are unnecessary. I know people who will not even say hello to their non-Muslim neighbors because they're not Muslim. And it's unfortunate, but that is the reality that some people live. It's like, why should I make an effort with them? It's not like, you know, I'm going to build a relationship. And they get surprised when they see that a religious person has a neighbor or even a friend who's non-Muslim because it's like, how they're not the same as you. Which brings me on to my next question, actually. You spoke about caring for 40 neighbors in all four directions, which makes me think basically your whole neighborhood, your whole community. So what is our responsibility to our community that we live in, not just the neighbors who live on our street? Our own community? I mean, the one we live in. So not the community that we belong to, for example, our religious community. I mean, the one that we live in, the neighborhood. Of course, uh, in every district or every, for example, part of the city that we is a community, we should be responsible. We should help the community if there is something about, I don't know, security of the community, about the health, about, you know, cleanliness, you know. We should try as much as possible to contribute, you know, with our ideas, with, you know, maybe volunteering. So basically, what is important is that they should see that we are there and our presence there is good for them. It's not that they say these are useless people or harmful people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So in some uh, countries, maybe expectation is more. In some countries, people you know, don't much expect. But what is important is that they should not think we are harmful or useless. I just remember the a story about the previous question. You know, Imam Musa Sadr, in city of Sur in South Lebanon, a Christian went to him. And actually, I saw then uh, an interview that recently a documentary was made. And this person was interviewed, I think person said, you know, M Muslims don't buy ice cream from me. And because he was selling ice cream and this was his uh, source of income. And, you know, in the city of Su, uh, there are majority Muslims. So Imam Musa said one day went and sat in his shop and ate ice cream. He didn't say anything, you know, to people, you know, you should buy it or eat. But he himself went there and and after that, people, you know, were going and buying, you know, ice cream from him. So 
this solved the issue. And this person, after so many years, is so grateful, you know, that this happened. That's such a beautiful story. I mean, you know, it's the best way to lead by example. Yes. When, and it's true. I mean, I know certain restaurants, for example, that I only eat in because I've seen this person eat in. So if they eat in it, then it must be okay to eat there. And not just, not even in terms of halal or haram, in terms of the food must be good, you know, if they yeah. go there regularly. And so he's promoting the business of someone. Um, that's a really beautiful way of doing it. Thank you. you know, if, if people are all having, you know, enough, then we can give preference to the people from our community because we are more sure about, you know, halal requirement and also we want to support them. But if we are all, for example, from one community and one person is, you know, only inside us and is suffering, then we can support this person as well. So I'm saying that you have to find the balance. I'm not saying just go to everywhere. Yeah. But when there are people who are suffering and we are you know, very much in number and you know, we are majority, we should be careful about these people who are in minority. Ahsan, so we have a responsibility to look out for everyone and be wise about you know, where we spend our money. Looking after neighbors is one thing, but then even let's say the shops in our community, so my local news agent where I buy whatever, the milk when I need it, when it's run out. So it's nice of you to be putting this into perspective as well, isn't it? It's not just individuals in their houses, but it's also individuals in their businesses. Yes. There is a story that uh, Ayatollah said, Ali Qadi Tabatabai Rahmatullah Alai. You know, he was a teacher of Allama Tabatabai, Ayatollah Bahjat. He was a very spiritual person, great Arif. So they saw him in the city of Najaf. He's buying, you know, vegetable, uh, lettuce, you say lettuce? Yes. Yeah. Which was not very fresh. You know, everyone goes for something which is fresh. And with the hot weather of Najaf, this could quickly, you know, lose freshness. But he was buying those things which are not fresh. <laughs> so he was selecting. And someone asked him, Aga, why you are doing this? You know, you should do the opposite. And he said, this man, you know, has family. And other people are not going to buy these things. For me, it doesn't make that much difference. So I buy this to help, you know, this. So, you know, to be so much mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that always you think what is the best. And this is through wisdom, not to be, you know, very, you know, superficial. Mm -hmm. With wisdom, you can understand without being taken advantage. But when it's going to make a good difference, when it's going to bring some positivity, you try to cater for the you know, need of people and support them. SubhanAllah, thank you very much. I guess at the moment with COVID and everything, everyone's talking about supporting the high streets and local businesses. So this is a very good reminder for us to do that for helping our communities as well. Um, it's lovely. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Sheikh. I think it puts into perspective that everything really that we should be doing in our life should be done selflessly for the good of the community for the good of others for the good of you know the harmony of society and i think sometimes we can be selfish neighbors and only care about our family our house our you know how we are feeling but we have to also treat our neighbors with empathy Yes. put ourselves in their shoes so for example let's say you've done building work in your house and you must have kept the neighbors up with the noise or disturbed them as soon as they do it you're like oh what annoying you know such an annoying noise i can't tolerate it and it's like they tolerated ours they didn't complain i should tolerate theirs and you know even with their children if their children are playing and screaming in the garden having fun and you're like, oh, this, their children are so annoying. But it's even these comments that we make that build this kind, this attitude of impatience and lack of tolerance. So it's nice to see that our ulama, even in their actions, emphasize that you should be as selfless as possible in your dealings with people and people in your neighborhood. You know, when Imam Khomeini was in Paris, you know, in Nofle Chateau, it was the time of difficulties, revolution, and you know, 
basically he had to go there because uh, Saddam regime had asked him you know to leave Iraq you know so he didn't have choices so he went there but he was very careful about the neighbors despite all those challenges at that time and he asked people who were with him to take gifts to the neighbors and apologize that because of his presence, maybe more journalists are going, visitors are going. And this was a small place, you know, a community. So he said, you know, we made their life maybe difficult. So he would send people did, taking gifts and apologize. And I think this is important that you pay attention to these small things, which are small in our eyes, but maybe, who knows, maybe these are, actually the thing that Allah considers more, you know, because this is thing that we underestimate. That story has always been a story I remember from childhood and it's always yeah. touched me that he went out of his way to do this. Often when we're so engrossed in the problems that we're going through, it's like, you know, the last people we will think of is our neighbors and doing something, like you said, Ihsan, doing something extra to look after them. Because he didn't have to give those gifts, you know, it was something he went out of his way to do. We're so, you know, engrossed in our problems, our, let's say we're ill, we've got stress, whatever it is. The last thing we're thinking is, how can I make my neighbor happy today? We're speaking of different neighbors, and I know you do a lot of work, interfaith work. So I wanted to ask you about our relationship with other faith communities. In our neighborhoods, we will have people of different faiths. And also, for example, in our centers, so our centers also have neighbors. And there are, for example, faith communities who are close to us. How should we treat these faith communities and how much do we need to be going out of our way to make good relationships with them? It's a very good question. You know, this is a, another dimension of neighborhood that we should make good relation with our neighbors from other faiths. For example, when I was in Islamic Center of England, we started an annual program with a church, which was, you know, St. Augustine Church, which was near us. And we had it every year on a team, but more than discussing, it was an opportunity for us to come together. So we had half of the program in the church, then coming to the Islamic Center for lunch and then continuing. Mm -hmm. And this was a very good thing that then some other places, you know, they also started this model because this priest and this church and the community who go there, the congregation are also somehow our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that we establish good relations with them. And sometimes, you know, we can work together for some of the, community issues or in general because you know my understanding is this that if you are only loved and respected by your own family or your own community only this is not enough because every person is loved by his family or community you are a man or woman of god if people across sects and religions and ethnicities love you this is a man or woman of God. But if only my own people, you know, love me, sometimes I say, okay, every gang, also they love their own, you know, people. Even, even Saddam Hussein, you know, has people that still love him. This is not enough. What is important is that love for you, respect for you should go across ethnicities, religions. This is a man of God or woman of God. Is this something, because when you're explaining this, it sounds like it's the management who should be doing this, or the scholars, or those who kind of have that responsibility. Or does this apply to everyone, every layman? As a layperson, you can do certain things, but there are things that should be done by the leaders and, you know, community leaders. So you can suggest to them, you can make sure, your, because sometimes community leaders are worried of, for example, if we start this, who is going to come? Who is going to help? Who is going to, so you can present, you can make yourself available. But uh, there are things that you can do it personally. For example, you work in a school, I don't in an office, uh, in university. There are also people that are your neighbors over there or in the community next to you is a church, for example. Sometimes, you know, visit them. Sometimes, you know, for example, there is Christmas, you know, give them a card, you know, flower. So I think this is very good. And they also feel 
encouraged that someone is appreciating what we are doing. Because, you know, in the end of the day, uh, we in the West should be very appreciative of any person who is working for faith, any person who is trying to be a voice of faith, because there is unfortunately a trend of people going away from faith. Yeah. So these faithful people are doing something great and it would be very good if they see we appreciate that. It's not that we only appreciate mosques, we appreciate churches, as the Quran also appreciates that. Allah says that Lola daf Allah in Nas Ba'adlahum Babav Lahud Bat Sawam or Bia or Salawat or Masaj Yud Karufi Hasmullah Kathira. So had it not been that Allah protects by using some people against people who want to be aggressive, all these places, synagogues, monasteries, uh, churches, and mosques in which names of Allah are mentioned a lot will be destroyed. So it shows that Quran say these are places that must be protected and respected. So we should show appreciation. Ahsant, I think that's a really important point that we show appreciation on just like a very basic practical level. For example, I know now COVID, we're not going to have majalis this year in Muharram because of the coronavirus. But normally what happens in Muharram is that unfortunately, we will disturb a lot of neighbors when we're going to our programs, be it with the bad parking. I mean, I've seen the way, the way some cars are parked and it's really embarrassing. Um, be it the litter after the majlis, we've littered the streets. Be it even the noise. You might be allowed to have loudspeakers on when you're inside the center, but when you're leaving, people are asleep in their homes and sometimes you're leaving very late at night. So in this practical kind of way, how important is it that we are very vigilant of our actions. Yeah, we have to be very careful. And many times people don't want to annoy neighbors, but we just are not careful enough. Yeah. Therefore, we need to remind each other that although these majalists are very, very important, still they don't give us right to do zolm to anyone. Especially, this is not, you know, once, this is every night, you know, and for every year. So it's very important that we have to be very considerate. Alhamdulillah, many centers, they make extra efforts to educate people, you know, and you know, to finish their programs, you know, earlier. But we have to be very careful because neither, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nor people for whom we are, you know, doing these majalis uh, would be happy if we annoy people and hurt people. We have to be very careful. Also, one of the things that uh, I have been suggesting, but... Uh, I think it still needs to be promoted is that if before Muharram, every center can send letters to their neighbors and explain to them that, you know, this is why we are, you know, going to have some special events and this is the philosophy behind it. And we are sorry that we may have more programs or longer programs. And even if possible, uh, you know, to invite them Whoever wants to come can come, even if every year 20, 30 people come, then over years you can educate many people. And you know, have a half an hour, a little a speech, a little clip that this is whole issue of Imam Hussein and this is why we are holding this, you know, so that they know why you are doing this, you know. And maybe some of them also be interested in the mission of Imam Hussein. And you know, I think this is very important because if they don't know what is happening, you know. It's making things more difficult. But if they know, and they know how important it is, and it's a whole you know, international thing that it's happening, and it's very important for us. It's not a party. It's not, you know, it's, you know, it's very important to educate people. Ahsanshah. And I think sometimes we shy away from this. I mean, even with our colleagues, our non-Muslim friends, sometimes we might be not embarrassed but maybe we we feel that we won't be able to answer some of the difficult questions so we avoid it so we don't really want to tell them that we're commemorating anything we're trying to fit in as much as possible we don't want to show them we're different whereas actually when we do show them that okay this is something in my belief that i practice and i want to share it with you then actually sometimes you'll find that they find it means you've respected them, that you've told them that. I have a non-Muslim friend who I once told that I, I was like, I really want you to consider converting to Islam, but I don't know how you're going to take this. 
And I was really shocked by her response. She said to me, this shows how much you value our friendship, that you're inviting me to your religion that you care so much about. And honestly, I did not expect that response. I thought she was going to say, excuse me, don't you respect me enough to know that I have my own religion? But no, she was honored that I had invited her. She's like, you love your religion so much that you want me to be a part of it. It's just sometimes we need to change the way we think about speaking to others about our religion. And I do know a mother who regularly sends letters to her child's school before Muharram to explain what's happening. So on a smaller scale, she's doing exactly what you've just suggested, Sheikh, which for her, I've seen that it benefits a lot because it teaches people about Islam, about Imam Hussein, and that's our duty, right? To spread the message as much as possible. I have a kind of analogy. We have, you know, some shops that uh, sell products from our own countries. Yeah. So, for example, if I want some Iranian uh, jam or, you know, pickled cucumber or I don't know, vinegar. So there are some shops that have these uh, items from my country. Okay. Yeah. So you can be very happy that, uh, okay, you know, this product is available in London and, you know, and if someone says, really? say so yes, go to this shop, you know, in this street, you know, uh, they sell these products. This is only a few shops and the customers are people who are also uh, not general public. The people who go to these shops are also people who go, for example, these community centers, you know, people from Middle East, etc. I say, unfortunately, our tabligh work is also like this. We are present in UK, for example, or the West, but like these products being present in some, you know, Iraqi shops or Iranian shops or, you know, Pakistani shops, <laughs> you know, you don't find them in super stores. Mm. These products are not for people who go just and accidentally can pick them up and say, okay, let me try this, <laughs> you know? If there is something on Tesco or Asda, you know, you may try it. But you don't go to an Iraqi shop, you know, to try an Iraqi product or Iranian shop. You know what I'm saying? Unfortunately, we have presence of these centers in the West, but very much in a, you know, like a, a compartment, very much secluded to ourselves. Yes. And as a, just as a sign, if you do a real, you know, survey, and ask, for example, any scholar, any resident alim, what percentage of your time during week is spent with non-Muslims, either in presence or you know recording something or doing something for them? What percentage? You would see that day and night, maybe they are working, but even there is no five percent for outside community. And I think this is something that we have to change. Because I believe that our presence in the West is also to help us to serve as a witness. And Allah says, كَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لَتَكُونُ شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ We have to be witnesses. And these witnesses, it's not you know, to convert them. It's just to be available as a God-conscious people, to be available, to do ihsan, to help, to you know, let them understand you, build bridges. Ahsan Shah, thank you so much. You've definitely inspired me to do more. Inshallah. May Allah bless you, Shah. Inshallah, thank you so much. You did mention colleagues earlier. Colleagues are also your neighbors. I mean, they're your desk neighbors, right? <laughs> your work neighbors. Is there anything specific you'd like to say about the way we should treat our colleagues? So, although they may not be literally neighbor, but as you said, these are work neighbors and these are very important. And we have things about your colleagues and your partners in business, how you should treat them, your customers, your, you know, staff, your employer, employee. So basically, you know, when you have candle, if this candle is in home or at work, it still is candle and gives light. You cannot say, I am a candle only at home. <laughs> if you are a candle, you are a candle everywhere. And Allah says, Isa alayhi salam said, Ja'alani mubarakan ayna ma kunt. We should aim at being like this, that wherever we are, 
we should be a source of blessing. People should feel comfortable. If people feel annoyed and, you know, troubled when I am there, this is not a good sign. And your colleagues at work are actually good um, cases because neighbors, sometimes it's difficult to initiate relation, you know, but with the colleagues, you have already good uh, relation and good ground to, you know, build on that several hours every day you are together or university students, you know, with classmates, you know, these are all important relations. Um, I think an important point that you're making is that the time we spend with these people is quite significant. Yes. Even the neighbors on our street, when we're seeing them go into their car and put their rubbish out or whatever it is, our, neighbor, our colleagues at work, you might think, oh, this is just a very professional work relationship, but you're spending very significant amount of time with them. So our time on this earth is accounted for, right? Yes. We're going to be asked how we spent our time. So if we've spent it, and especially the treatment of people and how we spend this time, they come hand in hand. Ahsensha, thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, I guess one of the things is people fearing how to have that conversation with others. I think many of us perhaps not sure how to have that conversation, especially when it comes about religion. You might get a bit stuck on some areas. Um, you perhaps don't want to offend anyone. You might be hesitant to say what you want to say because you don't want to be sounding like you want to convert people because that's not what you're trying to do. It's just yeah. getting a better understanding of who we really are and what we are, uh, what we believe. So I, uh, maybe, do you have anything to say on that in terms of how do we... Yeah, you know, we, we have to be a steadfast but patient. Uh, sometimes these relations cannot be built, you know, in the first week, first month, but little by little they can be. And if trust is established, they don't misunderstand you. If there is no trust, no relation, and all of a sudden, you know, you do certain things, they may misunderstand you. But as I said, you know, the work relation is very good because already you know each other and you have to interact with each other and it's every day, several hours. So that's a great opportunity also uh, at work, but also with the neighbors, uh, still we can try. And sometimes there are local initiatives that also maybe we can use them you know there are initiatives that people of community come together maybe we can be present there and active there you know somehow also sometimes we can divide the task if for example a few of us live in the same neighborhood we can monitor and then divide the task okay you go to this meeting i go do this you know so that we somehow cover and um, what you just mentioned now about some of us living in the same neighborhood how important is it that we you know keep in contact with those from our own community who live in the same neighborhood as us and liaising with them. You know, simple things like you're, you're going somewhere, do you need a lift, for example? How do yeah, you that would be great. If there are members of our community, it's like the same family and we have to have a special relation with them and make point that, you know, we meet, for example, if there are sisters, you know, they can sometimes meet, you know, maybe every few months, you know, at least, you can have an event together, you know, it's very important. And also, you know, when uh, you feel there are other women in that uh, neighborhood, you know, it gives you some kind of confidence and, you know, you feel you are not alone. It's very good. Yeah, I think it also gives you this sense of someone's got your back in a way if yes. you need to rely on someone. I've lived in an area which is far from the community and let's say you're all in a majlis and you can't rely on anyone to ask for a lift back because you know no one's going your way. Whereas when you yeah. do live in an area where there are people from your community, it's like, oh, can you give me a lift back? It's, you know, it also creates relationships, it creates friendships, even though it's someone you don't know. But because they're from your own community, you feel comfortable enough to maybe make that request. Shekhan, before we end today's discussion, are there any tips that you could leave us with how we should be more active caring neighbors in the streets and neighborhoods we live in what is important is to look for opportunities maybe sometimes it's difficult to start something by your own but at least 
uh, we should open our eyes and look for opportunities to know people, to help people. And in certain occasions, like, you know, for example, uh, New Year, or for example, if it is our own Eid, for example, these are occasions that everyone is happy to receive a gift or a card, or, you know, for example, you knock the door and, you know, do something. The time or the money that you spend, you know, on buying gifts or card, you know, the time and money, these are not wasted. These are all things that you can do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as a good cause. Inshallah, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us balance so that with wisdom we can do justice to all our responsibilities, inshallah. Inshallah. You've definitely inspired me and I'm sure all the listeners, but unfortunately, Sheikh Shomali, we've come to the end of today's episode. We would like to thank you so much for giving us your time to discuss this really important topic with us. My pleasure. And I pray that all our listeners would be, inshallah, healthy and safe and blessed, inshallah. inshallah. Thank you very much also to you and Sister Fersat. Thank you. Inshallah. And, and to our listeners, we want to thank you for tuning in. Feel free to do, leave us a comment on our social media handles. And to find out more, please visit our website, thegoodtree.faith. Till next week, fi amanillah. Join us next week with Sheikh Mohammed Saeed Bahmanpur as we discuss the relationship with those that have passed away.